I became very good friends with, and he was a very old man. And one day he said to me, I want to take you to lunch, and I want you to bring the president of the college. And I thought, well, why? You know? So we go to lunch, and, you know, he's very old, and he's forgetting things. And he's like, what, what if I could bring Frida Kahlo's art to the college? Would you like to do an art show with that? And I was like, you know, yes, it would be wonderful. But how are we going to get Frida Kahlo's art here, right? That was such a, a, a far-fetched idea at the time. And very much like this space, we were not a certified museum, right? We were not a space where we could house $113 million worth of art. But after um, he put that idea in my head, I was like, what if we could get Frida Kahlo's art here? So this, here's a situation. Here's how this came about. My friend, Alan Peterson, this man who was a donor and loved to come see musicals at the theater, he had a vacation home in Denver, Colorado. And it was a very small association. Very wealthy people lived there. And this man bought a condo next door to him. And his name was Carlos Phillips. And when Carlos moved in with his family, he's, he's from Mexico, some of the other people in the condo association was like, who's that and why is he here? And we don't know who he is and a little, a little cold. So my friend Alan was like, I don't understand why everybody's being like this. And he hosted a dinner party for everybody in the condo association to get to know this new family and get to know Carlos. And the two of them became really great friends. And one day, Carlos told him what he did for a living. And what Carlos told him was that his mother owned the largest collection of Frida Kahlo art in the world. And that he now owns this collection because his mother died. And he has this museum in Mexico that he has to keep going. And then over the years, the two families became friends. And when Carlos wanted his son to be able to go to school in the States. Alan was, he, his kids were very well educated, but they wanted to go to Northwestern here in Illinois. Alan said, let me, let me bring him here, bring him, we'll take him on a tour. You can see the college. So the two families became lifelong friends over 40 years together. So Alan said, I know the family that owns the largest collection of Frida's in Mexico. And let's see if we can if he'd be willing. So he made the connection with me and Carlos. And I couldn't get the idea of my head. And so I wrote a letter and I said who I am and what we'd like to do. And I said, I realized that this is a spectacular opportunity. So if we get this, we're not just going to hang the art in the wall. We are going to make this a really unique experience because we're college We'll do educational things so that kids don't know who he is and students know who he is. We'll do cultural things in the community to build bridges and bring the community closer together. And you have to remember, this was during the Trump era, right? And so it was, there's a little bit of like, how is it going to go? How are people going to feel? The minute we announced that we were doing this, everybody went crazy. Everybody was excited. The community started getting really excited. I reached out to friends in West Chicago who have a Hispanic cultural, the DuPage Hispanic Cultural Council, and talked to them and said, what do you think? I called the National Mexican Museum in Chicago, and I said, what do you think? And they said, you have no right to do this show. You're not prepared to do this show. You don't have the experience to do this show. You have the national treasures of Mexico. You could ruin everything, right? So... When we met with the Olmedo Museum, they said, yes, you can loan the art for the low, low price of $400,000. And you have to pay for three private jets to bring the art back and forth. And you have to pay for curators in three private separate jets to accompany the art because the art is the national treasures. And you have to have a museum with impenetrable walls with a double heating and cooling system. So if one goes out, the other one kicks in because the art can't be in a space that's too humid or too cold or too dry, right? 
So I said, give me the list. And we, we had a list and it was pages and pages and pages of what we had to do in order to accept this art. And so it was a 95 page to-do list of what we would have to do to get this art. And we would have to raise $4 million. And uh, in order to make all of this happen, because we had to remodel the museum. There were windows in the museum. All those windows had to be, all those to go. And we had to put in concrete with wrought iron uh, inside of it so that all the walls were impenetrable. We had to put security on the roof, security around the building. I mean, it was like quite a thing. So this is Alan Peterson. That's the president of the college and that's me. Um, on our day, we decided to go to lunch. So that's Alan and this is Carlos, the two best friends. And the two of them reminded me a lot of each other because they were both big entrepreneurs. They were both very successful. They both love to have a half a bottle of wine for lunch together with friends. They were both had a great sense of humor um, and, and they were very charming. They were both really charming men. So Alan said, why don't you come to Mexico and come and see the museum and come and see the art? And so I went and that's his mother, Dolores Olmedo. And I said, how did your mother end up with so much of Frida's art and so much of Diego's art? And he gave me a very polite answer. And then I started doing research and then I started learning. Okay, this is a picture that he did of his mother, Diego Rivera. Does everybody know who Diego Rivera is? Mexico's most famous artist, Frida's husband. Diego Rivera was a womanizer. He had quite a few wives. He was an atheist. He was, uh, loved to have a drink, loved to have a drink. And he was very boisterous. He was a brilliant muralist and a big, huge, uh, political figure during the Mexican Revolution, a very big character. Very few artists during their lifetime are known as the world, as the country's most famous artist. He was, right? He was very successful in his own lifetime. He was in an elevator once with Dolores Olmedo and her mother and said, your daughter's beautiful. I'd love to paint a portrait of your daughter. And the mother was like, oh my gosh. And they were very, very uh, high society. And the mother was like, oh, Diego Rivera wants to paint my daughter. That's awesome. She, yes, you can have, you can get a painting of my daughter. She was 14 years old. That's what he came back with. The mother wanted to have a stroke, right? She didn't say you can paint a nude painting of my daughter. She never expected that. Diego and Dolores had a relationship for many, many, many years. That painting was also painted. I'm sorry, she was like 17 shortly before Diego married Frida. Dolores was always Frida's nemesis. Dolores was the other woman. When Frida died, Dolores was a very smart and successful businesswoman. And she loved artists and she loved art and she invested a lot of her money into art and philanthropy. And Dolores took care of Diego as he was dying. She nursed him to his death. She let him live in her home. And she, he and her had this friendship and this idea that this art during this revolutionary period needed to stay together. And she had huge collections of Mexican art to preserve the history of Mexican art. And he said, I will leave you all my art and all of Frida's art if you promise you make a museum for all of Mexico to see it. And she did. And that's how Dolores, the other woman, ended up with all the art. And then Dolores died and she left it to her son and her son kept that museum going. So when I went to Mexico, I went, uh, we, in, this is a picture of when we announced that we were doing Frida and everybody was really excited and we had a lot of press there and Alan spoke. Um, and that's the Almedo museum. And it kind of looks like a castle cause it's this gorgeous hacienda um, about an hour and a half, two hours from, is it about two hours from Mexico City where the Olmedo Museum is? And, um, and what, what the son explained to me was there's a beautiful chapel 
in this hacienda and in this museum. And I said, why did your mom have a church in her home? And he said, because during the Revolutionary War, if the, if the fighters saw a church, they wouldn't bomb it. And so they made a church within the hacienda. And it's a big, huge estate where all of Diego and Frida's art was. And this is the curator that I worked with. And this is one of the paintings that Frida did that was actually in our show. And then I went to, can you guys see? I feel so bad. Do you guys want to turn or move or you're good? Okay. Um, uh, I went to the Casa Azul and that's Frida's house where Frida grew up. And I have to tell you, when you walk into the Casa Azul, uh, it's in Coyoacan, about 30 minutes outside of, of Mexico. And there's something about it. When you walk in, you feel uh, that this is a very special place. She was born and died in this house. They, she called it the Casa Azul, the blue house. Um, and although the outside is just flat, you know, you just see these, these walls. It's like a big square compound. And a model of that house is here. Um, and going to the Casa Azul, I wanted kids in America to see what her house was like. And I was obsessed with trying to make a model of exactly what the house looked like. So I wrote to the Olmedos and I said, I have these sketches and drawings of what I think it is. Can you guys send us, do you have drawings of the house? They said, absolutely. But no, we can't send them to you because it's housing so much. It's half of the other half of the Frida Kahlo collection. We cannot send anybody any of the drawings of the building but we can look at it and tell you if you're close. So when I sent them my drawings of how I wanted to make this, this model of Frida Kahlo's house, which is in the children's area, they were like, okay, move the door a couple, couple feet over this way and move that. And um, it's a pretty close representation. What's very cool about this house is it's almost like a U shape. And in the center is this courtyard. So this is the kitchen, the living room, and then there's bedrooms, but everybody faces the courtyard. And the garden is absolutely spectacular in this house. This is a picture of the kitchen. They had a wood-burning stove. Frida said the food tasted better. You would start the fire within all those little holes in the stove. So I think when you start seeing pictures of the inside, you can see why I was so captivated with the house and the style. And I wanted people to be able to see where she lived and grew up. So she grew up there with her mother and father. That's where she convalesced after her accident. And then later in life, Diego, uh, Frida's father couldn't afford to keep the house anymore. It, it was huge. It was like a city block big. And Diego, um, after Frida's accident, uh, Frida's parents were really having trouble financially. And when Diego married Frida, there was kind of a deal made that Diego would pay for the house and buy the house and they would live there and they bought a smaller house for the parents. That is uh, another picture of the kitchen, but you can see how lovingly Frida uh, decorated that house, right? With the Frida and the Diego. Diego was the love of her life. They had a really, really tumultuous relationship. He, uh, he had a lot of affairs. Um, she suffered a lot but they always were great partners and, um, and great friends throughout their, their entire lives and were there for each other uh, until the day Frida died. This is a picture of Frida's bed and that, that item on the bed is her actual death mask. Um, you can see her book collection. Frida was a really good reader. She read and wrote and spoke in five different languages. She was very intelligent and very well educated. So here's something else I wanted to show you. When I went to, through Frida's bedroom, this was uh, a curio cabinet at the end of her bed. And I was like, what's with all the old dolls, right? And it was just so many dolls. Frida loved dolls. There's several paintings that she's painted where there's a doll laying on the bed. She could never have children. So some people say it was kind of her, her thing. And when she was bedridden, she and her friends would go travel. She'd say, please bring me a doll back. So there's dolls from different countries. 
there's also a lot of puppets in there. And when she was sick and in bed, her family would do puppet shows for her. There's also a puppet of Contine Fluss in there. Anybody know who Contine Fluss is? Who's Contine Fluss? Pardon me? You saw him upstairs? Yes. So Contine Fluss was a comedian. But um, what I learned was during this period in the 30s, and so what was going on in the 30s? Anybody know? 1930s, what was happening in the world? The Great Depression, right? And in the 30s and 40s, and the, you had the Mexican Revolution that, that happened in the early 1900s. It was a great time of transformation and political upheaval. The puppets would do comedy shows about government, right? So it was like their version of a Saturday Night Live. And Frida loved to go see these puppet shows that did comedy about the government and politics. But she had a great collection of dolls from all over the world. And she also loved indigenous dolls made throughout the Americas and South America and Central America. So upstairs in the children's area is a collection uh, of dolls that I, cr I got over the years that to represent her collection. This is a picture of Frida's garden. How about that for a garden? They really loved pre-Columbian Mexican history. Can you see the pyramid? So she had a pyramid created to, um, she had a pyramid made so that it could host all of Diego's pre-Columbian statues. He had all kinds of Aztec and Mayan statues and that's where they were displayed. Frida loved animals. She had a monkey, a parrot, goats, bunnies, a deer, dogs, cats. Um, her cat was Senorita Gatita. Her dog was Mr. Zolo. She um, loved animals. And you have to remember, she was very sick through her life. She had 30 surgeries throughout the course of her life. So she spent a lot of time in this home. And then she would go out into her garden. And it was sort of her paradise, right? And it was her comfort place. They said that the monkeys were awful. Her pet monkeys would come in and steal food all the time and run back out. Um, but they had great fun. And, and she had like a menagerie of animals. This is another home of Frida and Diego's. After Frida and Diego moved to the U.S. for a while, Diego did some commissions here in San Francisco and then in Detroit and then in New York for the Rockefellers. And when they moved, they had a lot of problems during that time and they fought a lot. And then they decided when they moved back to Mexico that they would get along better if they had separate houses. But so this... Little one is Frida's house, and this big one is Diego's house. And they had their studios there, and they each had a little apartment within the studios. And there's a bridge right there, and I'm standing on this bridge that connected the two. Now, I think it's a fabulous idea. I'd probably be married if we had houses like that. And they would walk across the bridge to go see each other. These are dolls that were in the studio of Diego and Frida. If you go up and see the doll collection, you'll see dolls exactly like that upstairs in the collection. These bigger dolls are kind of fun. So these big, large um, dolls <laughs> were dolls that they would sacrifice. And what they would do on a certain day is you'd make these big uh, paper mache spirits and dolls in the shape of a politician. And then you would show firecrackers to them and explode them up in the air. What a great idea to get your frustration out rather than write on Facebook. And so they had a huge collection of these, of these big dolls in their studios that they used to make and sell with the different politi politicians that annoyed them, right? And they would put firecrackers in them and send them up. We also went to Brooklyn to do some research on the show um, and on Frida. They had a Frida show. This is an American collection of Frida Kahlo works. Um, you can see Frida was known for doing self-portraits. The American collection is sort of the best of and the prettiest of Frida. The Almedo collection that we had was the grittiest, most personal. So 
when you think about Frida, a lot of people go, oh, she made all those pretty self portraits. But there's also a darker side of Frida. And, and Frida was um, inspirational to many people for many things. What do you like about Frida? What does anybody here like about Frida? Anybody? The what? The duality of life, like? Yes, yeah, she was not afraid of death. She explored death a lot. that she, after, one, that she didn't start painting until after she was better, two, that she would look in the mirror, and that's how she started. I mean, yeah. So, Do you know what she said? I paint myself because it's a subject I know best, and I paint myself because I'm so often alone. I also right? To, um, a seminar about her in San Antonio, they at the botanical gardens, they had, like, a, a, a garden, but there was also, they were speaking on her, like a seminar about her. And they said, this person had read up many things about her. And one of the things that she said that stuck to me is that how everybody seen, not everybody, but a lot of people seen her as being like uh, maybe sickly and with that kind of weak. And that she really was not that way. She was, she, in some of her paintings, you can see that she did think of herself as someone strong. And oh gosh, Frida had, had incredible determination. Frida had 30 surgeries throughout her life. And when you go through and you read about some of these surgeries, like when they did the surgery on the wrong vertebrae, and you have to remember we're talking about surgeries that happened in, from the 1925s, right? Not the greatest medicine that we had. But her niece, and I, I read so many books on Frida, the best book I read is done by her niece. And her niece wrote this book and said, you know, people think Frida was sad and pain. She, Frida was, she said, Frida was the most joyful person you would ever meet. She said, when the, Frida died, the house, the joy in the house went with her. She always had fresh flowers on the table. She always made everything pretty. She'd always make, was entertaining. You know, she had help. She was, she had lots of help. They were very well off, her and Diego. But that she was a very joyous person with a great sense of humor. So this was a Frida Fest <coughs> that we had, but I'm going to go and tell you a little bit about Frida's life. These are some of the pictures we had in our Almeno collection. Um, this was one of Frida's first paintings and why it's so significant is you can see the difference in her style. Do you see this one right on the end? That was the first painting she painted and one of the first portraits she painted of a friend of hers. And that's when she was in bed. And she was trying to paint like a Renaissance painter, right? She was trying to have that European style. But then as life went on, Frida really got no, what Frida was known for and when she got famous was when she started doing more folk art. And she was trying to elevate the status of regular people. Frida was always a champion of the underdogs. And uh, so that's pretty much her thing. So let me tell you a little about Frida. Her father was German. Her father was sent over by his parents at 17 because his dad remarried and the woman didn't like him. So the dad gave him some money and said, go. And he, he started a life in Mexico. He married a woman and the woman had twins and she died in childbirth. He was working in a jewelry store. The night his wife died, he went to the father of this girl and said, I'd like to ask for your wife's, for your daughter's hand in marriage. The girl he worked with in the jewelry store, that's Frida's mother. And the two babies that were, that, that the mother died of in childbirth, the twins were sent to a convent to be raised. He married uh, Matilda. Matilda was really, really, really crazy, super fanatical Catholic. And they didn't get along on that level because the father was uh, Jewish. So it was this very unique combination of, of a couple. The father was very well read. And one day Matilda saw his pictures and she said, you should be a photographer. So she started nurturing that in him. He ended up being the photographer for the country. He was the photographer that documented all the big buildings going up and all the big ribbon cuttings and opening ceremonies and things like that. He was a phenomenal photographer. He was very well educated and very well read. 
they had Frida when she was six. She got polio and she was really sick and she was home alone a lot. And the father spent a ton of time with her trying to rehabilitate her. And instead of coddling her, he made her do sports and he got her encouraged to do sports that women don't normally play. He had her play soccer, uh, football soccer. He had her uh, do swimming, play baseball to try to get strong. And Frida did great at all of that. And he really rehabilitated her. And that's when the connection between the two got very strong. He was always very partial to Frida. They had two other kids, but Frida was always the favorite. He also spent a lot of time reading and teaching Frida to read in English as well as she read in Spanish. She also, as I told you, could read in French and in German. So she read a really deep collection of philosophy books and history books. She knew European history. And the father was determined to get her into this new school. So after the Civil War, one of the things, the education wasn't for everyone before the Civil War. They started a school called the National Preparatory School, like a big college. And there's 2,000 students admitted. Out of the 2,000, only 35 were girls. And Frida was one of the 35 admitted to the National Preparatory School, so like a college. She goes to the National Preparatory School and she's very involved in all the politics of the time. And she has, hangs around with this very group, uh, this group of guys that are very involved. And they're having a great time and they're, she's very vivacious and she wants to be a doctor. She's very successful in school. And her dream was to be a doctor. And she's going back home one day to Mexico City from her school. And they're taking a bus. Buses aren't like buses now, right? Buses then in the 1920s were kind of open air with big long benches. And she was on the bus and the bus got T-boned by a trolley. Well, the bus was made of wood. So if you think about wood, if I took a bunch of sticks and we bend it and we bend it and we bend it, it shatters out. And that's what happened. Frida got shattered out. When she landed, she landed on a metal railing. And one of the rails went through her hip, through her uh, pelvis, and out the other side. She shattered her collarbone. Her leg was broken in, in I think, 11 different places. Um, her ribs were broken. Her collarbone was broken. Her spine was broken in several places. When her boyfriend found her, she was lying in a pool of blood. And uh, somebody said, you got to get that rail out of her. And now we know better, right? We would have waited. But some man put his knee on her chest and just pulled it out. Well, then she was bleeding uncontrollably and they got the Red Cross and they begged the Red Cross to take her and they took her. It took her, um, it was a month before she woke up and then three months uh, in the hospital and then she recovered for one year at home. And once again, Guillermo spent a lot of time with her. And as she was laying in bed, Guillermo said, you know, we have to do something because you have to think about this girl's very vivacious, very smart, very active, all these friends. And now she's in bed and she can't move and she's in a body cast. And so he, um, the boyfriend who she loved very, very much, um, she was writing him letters his family sent him away to Europe because they, were, they didn't want him to spend his life just nursing her. So then she was very depressed and she did her first portrait. And her dad had taken, said, let's get her paints and maybe she can lay in bed. And he put a mirror above her bed so that she could paint to get her mind off of things. Well, she ended up doing a beautiful self-portrait of herself that she mailed to Alejandro. And she said, you know, here's so you don't forget me. And um, so she was always a very passionate, very romantic person. Um, after she rehabilitated and, and she, she started getting involved in politics, she didn't go back to school. And that's where she met Diego Rivera. And Diego fell for her right away. And she brought her, her art to him and said, what do you think? And uh, he said, go home and paint a couple pictures and I'll bring them back and I'll tell you what I think. Well, 
he went over and looked at her art and he liked her more than her art, of course, right? And he said, oh, they're fabulous and this and that. And the mother was not happy because he had been divorced three times. He was an atheist. He was a womanizer. He was a drunk. He was a communist. He was outspoken. Everything a mother would not want for her daughter, right? And she said, he's 300 pounds. She's 98 pounds. He's going to kill her. And she said, this is, the, this is a marriage between an elephant and a dove. And the mother did not want to go to the wedding, um, but she did go. Um, and the father, of course, stuck up for Frida and said, you know, he makes her happy. And they let, him, they, they let them marry. Shortly after they married, Diego got commissions to work in the United States. And Frida went and traveled all over the United States. And this was one of the paintings she did. And a lot of people say, oh, she was, um, she was a surrealist, because look at this. But when you know the story, she met, this is the most famous botanist in the United States. And she got to meet the wife. He had died, right? And so she met the wife, and the wife took her, and she said, I, we don't really get to tell people, but this is where he's buried, and this was his favorite tree. And Frida was like, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful, because he's underneath the tree that he created, that he started, that he grew. He's the man that's, that is uh, responsible for hybrid plants, you know, when you cross two different vegetables or two different plants. And Frida so then painted this picture in honor of him as being like a hybrid with the tree and that he was buried under the tree and now is part of the tree. And to her, she said, well, this isn't surreal. This makes total sense, right? So although she did some surreal work, um, uh, it was interesting because in her head, it wasn't surreal. It was just true. Um, she, she, in 1934, she uh, had a, a miscarriage and I told you that she was impaled. She could never carry a child to term. So, um, uh, sorry. So this is the picture, the painting that she painted. Now you have to remember this is the 30s. So to paint a painting about losing a child in the 1930s is craziness, right? People didn't talk about those things. To this day, sometimes people don't want to talk about those things. What Frida had the ability to do um, was paint pain, right? And make painful experiences art, but it also kind of started to reach out to other people who are also experiencing pain. Um, help me out. What is the word for the little pictures that they paint in churches? Uh, retablos? The, um, they paint pictures in churches in Mexico to ask for a blessing. Like you'll see a picture of a lady with no leg, right? They'll paint a little painting and ask God to please heal the leg or heal the cancer. Um, and it's very famous in Mexico and in a way, and they got healed. So they paint a picture of the pain or the hope or the wish or the, or the, the suffering. In a way, Frida was painting retablos, right? But as fine art. But she was also talking about subjects that people just didn't talk about in the, you know, at that time. And she kind of broke the mold, right? Um, there was a man who stabbed his wife to death and she wrote, she painted a picture of it because she didn't like the idea of abuse. And, she, and the guy said, no, 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 no. I didn't stab her. I just nicked her with a knife. Well, she was stabbed all over. So Frida did a painting called A Thousand Little Nicks, right? To kind of say, why are we letting this happen? We shouldn't let this happen. So she started standing up for things through her art. These are not the paintings you often see, right? You always see the pretty portraits of Frida. This was part of the Olmedo collection, which was Diego's collection, which was Frida's most complex work and serious work. Um, she, they had a very vivacious life. Mexico was the epicenter of culture in the 30s and 40s. They had many, many friends. Anybody who was anybody would come to the Casa Azul for dinner or for a party. Um, and all different people would come and visit them. Political people, celebrities, musicians. Casa Azul was a very famous place to come visit. And they traveled the world and they knew a lot of people in America and in Europe. Frida did a show in Paris. 
And, um, and through these years, as Frida starts doing better and better, she gets an opportunity to do her first show in Paris. And guess who came to her opening? Who do we know that's a very famous Parisian artist? Pablo Picasso. And Pablo Picasso made her a pair of beautiful earrings for opening. And she did great. Everybody loved her art. Well, Diego had a big affair and it was all over the papers in Mexico while this was happening. So he would retaliate, right? With an affair or something like that. And that's when Frida was like, that's it. We're done. And they divorced for one year after that. So in the 40s, Frida starts to really do well. Mexico, for the first time, commissions work from her. She started to get asked to be in museums and things like that. And she's finally getting accepted as an artist in her own right, because she was always in Diego's shadow, right? And then her health really started to fail. And they realized she had gangrene, and they had to amputate her leg. And when that happened, it really depressed her. The last four years of her life, she was uh, bedridden. But she decided, rather than be sad, nothing made her happier than young people. And so she taught young people how to paint. And she had all these kids that would come to her house, and she would teach them to paint and spend time with the kids. Um, so in one way, the last years of her life were very sad. And in some ways... It's amazing to see her perseverance, right? She kept teaching and she was determined to do the art show that they offered her first solo show at a museum in Mexico. And she showed up in her bed. And I think if you've seen the movie Frida, they show that she comes up in her bed. She's like, I am not going to miss this. And um, that's a picture of, she thought if she's going to have to have a fake leg, it's going to look awesome. And she, she painted her fake leg so that it was beautiful. So when you look at the way Frida dresses, Frida was always, when, when we look at this clothes, sometimes for younger people, you think, oh, that's how they dressed in the 30s. No, it's not. People in the 30s dress more like we dress now. But Frida was such a fan of Mexican culture. And the dresses that she wore and the embroidery that she wore was from a very specific part of Mexico where women were in charge of the money. Women controlled the market. Men couldn't have stores in the market where in this very little town where, where she uh, got this style of dress near Oaxaca. And so this style of dress represents women who are strong, right? And they would wear the big jewelry and the long earrings and the big necklaces to show that they had power and they had strength and they had their own influence and they made their own decisions. So it was two parts. She was wearing it because she liked that part of Mexico and the women and the strength that the women had. And she also liked that it represented Mexican culture. And she was very proud of Mexican culture and heritage. And she wanted to keep it alive. And so she always was actually herself a walking work of art wherever she was. And that was sort of her brand. Um, when she moved to San Francisco with Diego, when they came here to do some work, in San Francisco is Chinatown. And she, for the first time, saw these beautiful, bright colored satins. Many of Frida's dresses have satin, um, satin areas of them and embroidery and things like that. She really fused a lot of the Japanese fabrics into, into her clothing, but she had a big sense of style and flair and she would draw the flowers that she wanted embroidered on her dresses. So I wanted to share, we know Frida as um, someone who is diligent. We know her as somebody who perseveres. We know her as strong. We know her as somebody who overcame great adversity physically. We know her as a great artist. But I think what I fell in love with Frida was as a family person and as somebody who liked animals. So here's Frida with her, her camito monkey, her favorite little monkey. And this is with her dear Granizio. And this is with her monkeys. Again, she had several monkeys. And that's with her Zolo dogs. So I think when you think about Frida, I think the reason she resonates with so many of us is she was more than an artist, right? She was a political activist. She was a romantic. She was a survivor. 
She defied stereotypes. Um, and she was definitely the people's artist. That's the first portrait she painted of herself. Um, the one that she did for her boyfriend that said, never forget me. And then you can see, she was trying to be like the European beauty, right? But then at the end of her life, this is the kind of portrait she painted of herself where she really embraced her identity and her heritage. And I can't think of anybody better to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month with than celebrating Frida Kahlo. So I'm grateful that you guys came today. I'm grateful that you're celebrating Frida here and that we could bring back um, a lot of these great memories. And I hear the mariachi music playing, so I don't want to um, infringe on your fun, but I'll answer any questions any of you have, if you have questions. Mm -hmm.